as I mentioned before, uh, I tried to, des to design this presentation uh, around uh, not getting too detailed to overwhelm somebody who's just learning, but still giving some information uh, for people who have a lot of experience developing in Perl, um, that they can uh, get something out of it. So let's start. First of all, history of Perl objects. Um, Perl version 5 was the first version of Perl to feature any kind of object-oriented ideas, concepts. Prior to that, it was a very procedural language, um, which was you know, fine for what people were using Perl to do in the early, um, I guess Perl was like 87 was the, when Perl version 1 came out. So from 87 until about 96, um, there was no object orientation in there, and that was great for what people were doing with it, which was string processing, um, system administration scripts, that sort of thing. Um, but Perl 5 introduced a very simple way of, 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 um, of doing objects. It was limited, but powerful enough that people could start using concepts that they'd been hearing about from C++ and, and starting to hear about with Java and some other object-oriented object, object -oriented languages. So, um, any questions yet? Okay. So next, uh, let's, let's talk about, and, and you guys who know this stuff, maybe chime in with some things that I don't have here. Uh, Perl 5 objects, um, they implemented some inheritance. So if you define a class or a package, as it's called in Perl, uh, you can define other classes or packages that inherit everything that's defined in the original one. So you have parent classes and child classes. Uh, you can have encapsulation. Um, and I forgot what encapsulation is. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. I understood it when I typed that up, but anyway. Like hiding stuff from yeah. callers? That would be more of a privacy issue. And that's that's one thing that, that isn't very well implemented in your okay. in your standard um, Perl 5 objects. Uh, overloading uh, operators. Uh, one thing that, you know, when you're taking a, a beginning Java class, you learn you can overload the plus sign and make it do all kinds of cool things. Or if you have, like, a, a, a class that implements a linked list, you can have a plus sign that essentially concatenates the linked lists. And that sort of thing, uh, you, can, you can do that in Perl, but it's not native. You have to use uh, another module in order to do that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and the polymorphism is a, another thing that you can you can you can do with some uh, uh, with some modules, but it's not um, it's not easily done with just the native Perl objects. Anything else that anybody wants to toss out about Perl five objects? Okay, we're getting there. Somewhere along, I'll remember what encapsulation is. Um, some people argue that Perl will never be a true object-oriented language because it lacks strong type constraints. It's not a strongly typed language. I mean, types in Perl are scalar, list, hash, and a reference to one of those, or a glob, or a file handle, that sort of thing. You have scalar references, um, but there's, you know, Perl by itself natively doesn't give you the ability to say, oh, this is a floating point, this is uh, a character or a character string, or this is an integer. Um, that's one thing that most object-oriented or languages um, have because uh, they, they will do, uh, allow you to call a method different ways based on the types of data that you give to it. So that's one thing that Perl lacks, but there are some ways around that that you can uh, make up for that. Uh, here's an example of some Perl, some basic Perl 5 object code, and we'll walk through that real quick. This is a, a package or a class called Boo. And the, uh, the new method, subroutine, is the constructor. So we have the, the name of the object class. Uh, we have a constructor method. The first thing you pass, the first parameter that the new subroutine receives, 
which it shifts off the, the default list, the at underscore list. Sometimes you'll see it, you shift has that as its implicit parameter. Sometimes um, you'll see it as this, or you'll see it as a list of parameters that gets its values from the, the default list. Um, so the, the first thing that you pass into your new, or your constructor, is the name of the class, which seems a little odd because we're defining all this in here, but you have to think about the way that Perl has to implement this when you're calling it, when you call foo new. That thing that, become, that, that you pass before new gets passed in as the first parameter to the subroutine. So the, Perl's kind of cheating, trying to, trying to pack this object-oriented capability into its non-object-oriented legacy. And so that's one thing you have to understand as you're going through this. Um, and then bar here would be like uh, an initializer, initial value that you want to pass into the constructor. So that's a, uh, a, an additional constructor parameter. So down here, what we do, the way Perl uh, implements objects is you just take a hash, and uh, an anonymous hash, really. It's, and then you return, down here, you return a, a reference to the hash. Um, and the, all the magic happens in here where we bless the hash. And after you bless it, it's still just a hash, but it has a little a few extra little powers. For one thing, it lets you call other methods that are associated with this package if it's blessed into this package. Um, one thing that you might expect is if in here we're storing bar in this hash, so it becomes a member variable in a sense, and you think, great, now that it's a member variable, the only way I can access it is through methods defined in this package. Not true. You can still access it just like a normal hash, and that's one of the complaints people have uh, in that there's no privacy. Um, and we'll talk about some ways that, that that's been dealt with. Um, so yeah, down here we, we add the class data to the class, and then we return this self object, the self reference, and then that becomes our foo object wherever we want to use it. And then here's an example of how we would actually use that. So we have that foo package declared somewhere else, and then we use foo. We create an object, say, foo new, and we pass in the number five, which we know, because we saw the code before, gets pulled into bar, and gets saved in bar. And then down here we, we have a method that we, don't have, we didn't show the code for, but we have a method called print bar that just prints out the value of bar or something like that. Okay, any questions before we move on to our next object-oriented paradigm? Okay, Damien Conway. Anybody see Damien Conway? He was here in uh, July. Yeah, great presentation. Not so much on the Perl. I mean, it was, his Perl was out there. But uh, he's, he's a pretty prolific author, and uh, not just an author of books, but also an author of CPAN modules. Um, he was here in town, and, and uh, the last time he was here, which was, I want to say 2004, 2005, uh, he came to uh, do some training for um, North Sky, Net Zero. And um, he does this thing, if he's in town for training, he gets in touch with the community and says, I want to do something for free for the community as well. So um, he gave a presentation on uh, Pearl best practices. And he had just released his book, Pearl Best Practices. And I was one of the lucky ones that got a free copy. So it was kind of cool. In, in, uh, in that book, he talks about his, idea, his suggestions for best practices for objects. And he points out some of these um, drawbacks, these inadequacies that the Pearl 5 object system has and ways that, that he has found that, uh, that make up for some of those inadequacies. And he called it inside-out objects. So it's essentially, you're still treating your objects like Perl 5 objects, blessed hashes, really. But it gives you uh, some privacy. And uh, there are several implementations of this, uh, but the best known one is the one that Damien uh, has published on the CPAN. It's called uh, Class STD. And, uh, 
It provides an exported subroutine called ident that provides a uni unique ID for objects. And this is, uh, he takes advantage of the lexical um, scope within a package. So here's an example. In this, he's got a cl this class is called person. And so he uses the class std that provides us with the ident method that we can use in here. Um, and what happens when you have a package and you declare some stuff is my inside the package? The scope of these variables is this package. Outside of this package, you can't see them. And so the idea behind inside out is you're storing stuff in these, in these uh, variables and outside of this package, you can't see them. So, well, how do you, um, how do you access the, the value? So you can't do this thing where you just treat your object reference as a hash and, and go out and look. You can do it like a data dumper on the hash and see what's inside because all you're going to see are uh, these object IDs. So actually, you won't even see that. Um, the uh, self is just a, it's a, um, it's a hash with a number in it. And then the object ID that's used inside the package <coughs> is created by this ident. It creates a unique ID, a unique number um, for the class. And so um, these variables that are scoped only within this package are how, and, and they're hashes that are keyed by that unique ID. And what that allows you to do is e even though you might, you might be able to use, you might use this, this particular package multiple times in a program, but each time that you in, instantiate a new instance of this person package as an object, it's going to get a unique ID in each of these hashes. And so that way you don't have to worry about collisions because each object has its own ID. And so these, as, you're, as you're creating more and more of these person objects, all you're really doing is just creating more keys and values inside these, um, inside these hashes that are only accessible from inside this package. So here we have this, uh, this constructor. Uh, it takes a class name, just like our standard Pro 5 objects do. do. Uh, you pass in a first name and a last name. And uh, then it does the whole self thing. It does it a little differently. It's got this do, and it puts in this scalar thing. I'm not really going to talk about that. You can read the class STD and find out what, what's going on there. But essentially, all we're doing is just blessing a, an anonymous hash, just like we did with the regular Pro 5 objects. And then we get an object ID by calling ident. Ident comes from class STD. And that gives us the unique ID. And then we can populate um, these, these uh, hashes with the values that were passed in. And then we return self. And then down here, so, this. So I have a question for you. Uh -huh. So when you're actually using this object then uh, in, your, in, with, in, like, in this context, uh, you, you will call new, say you call it 10 times. And so it's actually tracking every one of those news in that same package. Every single one of those gets its own unique ID. And then you can access any one of those news by, well, it, it returns self, and so, so you can access it by. You assign that to a different variable. To a variable. And then you can access that specific ID. So you don't even really care about the ID that. No, not outside the package. Yeah, not outside the package, OK. Yeah, the, the unique ID is only used inside the package. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so then down, if we look at this get first name, so this is a getter. Uh, you pass in self, that's the implicit parameter, and it returns the value in the first name hash that uh, has the unique ID that we get from ident. Ident's always going to return the same value for each object. So you don't have to worry about, oh, you know, if I call ident again, I'm going to get a different value. No, it, it has some magic in there that it always knows which object you're dealing with. It probably looks at the memory location the object's stored in or something like that. Um, 
And so what, what ends up happening here is you have private data in this object because it's not accessible except through the methods that you define, that you write, that allow you to get or set those values. And that's inside out. Any questions? So you said you don't want to talk about it, but what's going on with the do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Honestly, I really don't remember. But yeah, there's. Um, I don't even know if that's uh, if that's necessary. I, I I lifted that line straight out of the out of the pod, but. Um, I don't remember having to do that when I was I was writing inside out, you know, right after I went to this presentation back in 2005 or whatever, and I, you know, I was I was converted. And I started writing all my all my stuff inside out um, until you'll see what came after that. <laughs> so um, that's a good question. I wish I had the answer for you. I'll uh, check it out. Yeah, it, I think it's pretty well documented in the, in, the, uh, in the pod. Now, you would think, well, if there's something better than inside out, why am I mentioning it? It will come to pass. I'll, it'll all make sense um, at, when we're done. OK, so some other features of, of class STD. Uh, so the, the original inside out um, method, you know, the strategy that, that Damien uh, talked about in, in Perl Best Practices was pretty simple as to what I just described. But he's added some stuff since then in the class STD that make things a little easier. Uh, for example, you can um, declare, you can make your methods private so they can only be called from other methods in the inside your package by adding this attribute. This, uh, so you, when you declare your subroutine, you can say colon private uh, in, the, you know, in your subroutine declaration. And, and by doing that, um, that method, that subroutine can only be called from within the package itself. And uh, another thing you can do here is, is when you're declaring those um, lexical variables inside your package, uh, you can say um, colon ATTR, they're, they're, met, they're class attributes. And this does two things. One, it sets them up as a class attribute, but it also automatically creates getters and setters for them. So now you have a get first name and a get and a set first name. It automatically does those for you because most of the time, you know, you just, for set, you pass in a value, it plugs it in, you're done. And uh, that gets really redundant. So this is kind of a, a DRY uh, enhancement to, um, to the, you know, the base inside out. And then they, uh, he added these demolish and build methods, which are kind of wrappers around. Um, well, build is like your wrapper around new. And um, demolish is like your wrapper around destroy. So this is your you know, constructor and your um, destructor. And uh, you can read all about those in the, in the pod. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. This is an introduction, an overview, not a tutorial. Any other questions about inside out? Is it is it impressive? I mean, you, you have to realize what what he's working. He was working with Perl, so and he and the idea here is let's create some private uh, some privacy for objects, which wasn't there before. And this is how he does it. He does it by uh, taking advantage of the memory location that the the hash is stored in, and uh, let's let's store the values index reference. You know the the key keys of hashes where the keys are a unique ID for each object that you instantiate. Quick question about yeah. speed. Uh, is, there, is it pretty fast? Is it, so, is it so, something that you can... I would say that, that uh, your, your basic uh, inside out objects are pretty fast because there's really not a whole lot there as far as like... Um, um, it's pretty low, just allows you to be able to... So like if you code your uh, you know like um, very procedurally or you know ver uh, versus choosing to go this route. Yeah, there's not a lot of scaffolding here. Yeah. So there's not a lot of overhead at all um, to what to what what's going on. So I would say yeah, it's pretty fast. There are some uh, object systems that I'm not covering today that are implemented in XS. So it's all written in C. 
and those may give you a speed bump uh, over some other things. Um, who's used Moose? Anybody? Okay. We should probably do a full, full presentation sometime on Moose. Moose is one of the cornerstones of modern Perl. Um, if, if you're just getting into Perl uh, and you talk to somebody who's, you know, um, telling you what you should learn, uh, if you get the modern Perl book, which is available online for free, you can download it as a PDF um, or buy it to support the author. Um, Moose is one of those things that is, is kind of a cornerstone of, of modern Perl. And uh, it's becoming uh, a very important concept um, for Perl going forward. Uh, it adds a plethora of missing features um, from other object-oriented languages that Perl just hasn't had. Um, and uh, the classes are defined with metadata, which means that you're, you just have information about the classes and then the, uh, the Moose code goes through and parses that and creates your objects for you. Uh, a lot of automation reduces your code requirements. We'll find out that you know, you, something you would do in Perl 5 objects that would take 80 lines of code, you can do with Moose in 5. So it really reduces the amount of time that you're spending writing code. But all that automation requires code interpretation, so it slows things down starting up. So Moose is definitely not a good choice for if you're writing stuff in a CGI environment where every single request that comes into your web server invokes Perl and starts up an interpreter and loads all the libraries that are needed to run the code. But if you have a persistent thing like uh, Catalyst or Mojalicious where you have a Perl process that's always spinning, um, the only time you're going to incur this overhead is when you first run your, uh, your server. So it's generating it all on the fly? Yeah. Automated data? Right. This is one of those, you know, uh, last week, uh, last month, uh, that guy was, uh, you know, we talked about the, the fact that the Perl's architecture is old and there's no way to say, well, why don't we just run Perl on a just-in-time compiler? Well, you know, it's not really like that. <laughs> but if we could, this is the kind of thing we would put in a JIT. So, uh, so here's an example of a, of a person object that, like we talked about with the inside out stuff, but implemented using Moose. So we have a package, named person just like before, and instead of using class SCD, we use Moose. Now things start looking really weird for people who haven't done anything with Moose before. There's all these new keywords and things. But this is the metadata. So here we have the has keyword and then we define this attribute or class variable, first name. And then we, down here we specify some characteristics. Well, it's read and write. So that means it's, uh, we can change it after we initialize it. And here's some, holy cow, type constraints. It's a string. Same thing with last name. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this stuff down here, except to say that this make immutable thing speeds up Moose quite a bit. So if you don't have that, your startup overhead will be even worse. And actually, I take that back. I think if this actually makes your, your startup overhead worse than if you didn't have it, but your runtime is faster. So um, that's why they say, put it in there, because it'll, it'll make your programs run faster. And I don't know, I don't remember what the no moose does, but any questions about that? Okay, let's look at what I've got next. Okay, here we go. So here we have uh, declares a class variable. It's an attribute. I forgot that I had these little animations in here. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is RW. If it's an RO, then all you have is a getter. It'll automatically produce a getter and a setter if it's RW. Um, then we have some type constraint and some validation. Um, it's it's kind of weak. It's not like, uh, you know, if you've done like web form validation, you say, oh, I want a phone number that looks like digit, 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 digit dash, digit, digit, you know, that sort of thing. It's not that, I mean, I, I think there are some, um, some Moose X modules available on CPAN that give you that kind of detail. But out of the box, you get string, you get int, um, you get bool, 
which a lot for, for pro programmers to have even that level of uh, type constraint kind of blows their mind. Um, but you can also say that this is an array ref, or this is a hash ref, or this is a, an, an, an array, or this is an array ref of strings. You know, you can do that sort of thing to, uh, and, and then what happens is when you, when you pass that into your constructor and it doesn't meet that uh, definition, the constraint, then it throws an error. Okay, so uh, some other th cool things about Moose. Uh, you can set up subroutines to run before, after, and around other subroutines. So you're not in your head and you say, I've done this in Java. Say it'll be, uh, <laughs> um, they call it method modifiers, but what's really cool about this, this comes in really handy when you declare like a parent class and then you have child classes that inherit from it, you can define in the parent class, oh, I want some debugging to go before or around this method that I'm going to override in each of my child classes so you can track where values change and so forth. Uh, it's really handy for debugging, but um, I've, I've used it a few times not in a de debugging uh, case. Roles are what are called interfaces in other um, object-oriented languages, they essentially declare, define uh, behavior. And then you have override methods where you can override um, methods that are declared in, in parent classes and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and then you have a super method, which I didn't talk about here. So if you have a foo and bar inherits from foo, then in bar you can have some uh, method called baz that's also declared in foo. In baz you can you can say well this overrides baz um, but after it's done calling this code call super and super goes back up to the parent class and calls um, the baz that's, in, in, uh, that's defined there. Um, I mentioned just a second ago there are a bunch of modules on cpan that are in the musex namespace these are all kinds of cool extra things that you can add on to Moose. Um, for one thing, method signatures. Um, one of the nice things that method signatures does is it gives you, instead of sub for your methods, you actually have the keyword method. And, um, and then you can say, um, you, can, you can have methods that only take certain kinds of parameters. And then so you can have multiple methods with the same name. And again, Java lets you do this you know, natively. Uh, so you have methods that are the same name, but they behave differently based on what you pass to them. Type constraints, there's all kinds of type constraints you can have. Um, they're based on the, the, uh, these MooseX types. Uh, you have type constraints that are like IP address, or you can have type constraints that's like, a, one, of, one of the ones that a lot of people online have talked about is the path class, which is like an object-oriented uh, interface to directory structure. So path class is pretty cool because you, uh, you can say, you know, I'm in this directory, go up a level. And you, you don't even, it's, it's all platform independent, so you don't need to worry that, you know, am I on a Mac or Windows? And, uh, and it's object oriented. Well, this implements that as a, in a type constraint. So you can pass in a path class object into a constructor and uh, this, if you add this um, MooseX module, you get that um, type constraint built in. Uh, MooseX declare gives you a bunch of declarative sugar. It gives you a bunch of other um, um, keywords that you can use in your Moose. Uh, the auto box is, uh, is pretty cool. If I can remember what it does. Oh, <clears throat> auto box is cool because if you pass in a list, it automatically gives you the ability to call in an object-oriented fashion things like push and pop and, uh, and, and shift and unshift and things like that. Um, like, so if you have an object and, uh, and you have a method called, you know, get list, then you can have a push. Um, some value. 
and this because this is a list in inside the the uh, auto box automatically gives you these things you don't have to write them it's just anything that's a list automatically gets some of these uh, some of these methods it's kind of cool okay so let's uh, comparison I told you guys that the amount of code that you write when you're doing moose is, is substantially less so imagine if you will um, if you were going to do this with Perl 5 you know vanilla Perl 5 objects um, you have a package called person uh, you wouldn't use anything uh, and then you would have to think of everything that this this metadata says um, first of all we have to have a getter and a setter we have to make sure that the constructor um, and the getter are doing some some uh, input validation and uh, Think about the, the amount of code that you're going to write for that. So let's let's take a look at it. Oh, great! We're getting a line by line. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's another thing that Moose gives you automatically is the strict and warnings pragmas. So those get you get those automatically. Um, so here's your constructor. Essentially, what Moose provides for you, um, it makes sure that you passed in an argument called last name. And uh, if last name doesn't, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, pass the validation checks, then we throw an error. Um, here's your getter and setter down here. So basically, if you call last name with a value, it's a setter. And if you don't, it's a getter. What's that? It looks like uh, they're moving to more human readable yeah. Perl code. Would that mess up, let's say you're using the uh, Eclipse and the Perl module, would they get all lost with this nomenclature? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. I haven't used Eclipse. Yeah. Um, As it marks was, up the language for you. Yeah, look, you, you get some syntax highlighting issues. I, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, it's. What do you use for something like that? I use VI or VIM, but. It's possible that uh, this would be just fine. I, I don't know. It's not it's, syntactically. It's not bad. Uh, well, it's just the the keywords. The, the keywords are a little. You know, if if you if your head, if your editor is is keyed in on certain keywords, then it would would have issues. But there are lots of CPAN modules that give you additional keywords that you can use. Uh, so as long as it, as Eclipse is smart about it, um, it shouldn't be a problem. Because yeah, like the method signature stuff, you can use that outside of Moose, and uh, and call your subs methods. Okay, so Moose-like modules, as I mentioned before, there is some startup overhead. So what some people have said is, well, you know, what can we do to make Moose a little leaner, make it a little skinnier, and and, uh, and less of a. Um, Less bulky in, on the on the system, uh, especially for startup. So, um, so there have been some alternatives that have been written. Mouse. Uh, there's a mouse XS, which is pretty fast. Uh, Moo and Mo. Uh, there's even one called M, but I don't think it's very useful <laughs> because each one of these strips something out that they say, well, we can live without this. I think the next slide, yeah, here we go. This is a comparison of all the, um, you know, those, those four um, and what they give you. Um, some of this stuff will go right over your head, but essentially, you know, you have constructors. Extends is the idea that um, a parent-child inheritance. So if you, if you have a, 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 a class, a package called person, and then you have a, a class called manager, then instead of saying use base, which is what you would do in, in Perl 5 to say that this inherits from this, you say extends person. This manager is also a person. Um, so extends, as you can see, is pretty much implemented across all the, all the different uh, moose-like 
modules. Has allows you to define attributes. Does, um, what's it does do? Oh, does allows, if you have a role, and the role defines behavior, then you say does to say that this class uses that behavior. It does what the role defines. And uh, with is also like does. <laughs> and then you have your before, around, and after stuff that allows you to def you know, define, I want this method to run around this, this other method. And as you can see, the mo does not implement that. And then uh, some of these other things down here, um, as you get further and further down, you get down to override and super. We talked about that and the way you can override methods that are defined in a parent class uh, and refer to the methods that are defined in a parent class with super. Um, you only get those in Moose. So you can see that the, they kind of take their liberties in, ter in, in defining you know, what we're, what's important to them and what's not. Um, if I was going to uh, use one, in fact, I, I was looking at this wondering, uh, I've got a load testing um, infrastructure that I built using Moose. Um, and uh, I was wondering, well, if I wanted to shave it down a little bit, what, what would I choose? And I think I would probably choose Moo, although um, using mouse XS may be a better choice because I get that advantage of the stuff that's written in C. So maybe I'll play around with that and see what happens. But So um, last year, the author of Moose decided he was going to make a big push to get Moose in a future version of Perl in the core so that um, these meta objects um, would be a standard part of, of Perl. His name's uh, Stephen Little, and uh, uh, Stephen uh, was really frustrated because the more he pushed, the more the core. Perl 5 Porter's team pushed back and said, this isn't going to work. And um, most of the reasons they gave him was compatibility, backwards compatibility. Um, and so uh, in January of this year, uh, I was fortunate enough, I went to the um, Orlando Perl workshop uh, in Orlando. It was great being in Orlando in January, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. And he gave a, a presentation and basically said, I mean, he was really, uh, I, I would say he was, he was kind of burned out from trying to get the rest of the Perl community, the, these core developers, um, converted onto the, the P5 MOP, is what it was called, uh, Perl 5 Meta Object Protocol. Um, and he said, you know, screw you, I'm going to go off and create my own version of Perl, <laughs> in a sense. This is a Perl 5 interpreter written in Scala. I think it's Scala. Um, called Mo. And it would be syntax compatible with Perl 5, but it would implement the meta objects. And uh, so there was a lot of buzz in the community about Mo. You know, what's it going to be? How long is it going to take for them to get this out? Uh, you know, is. Is this going to be a rift in the community? Well, come Yapsy time in July, uh, he's back on the P5 MOP bandwagon saying we can put this stuff in the Perl core. And so he's reintroduced the P5 MOP uh, Redux. And, uh, and they're working hard on that. Um, one of the interesting things about that is that um, he has recently said that the P5 MOP implements objects inside out. So it'll be really interesting. Now we're seeing everything um, that we've talked about today come full circle. Um, and that, that will help them. That's obviously a very lightweight way for them to implement the privacy if they're using the inside out stuff under the hood. <laughs>